so uh, soon to be a good afternoon to everyone. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Emilio. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Can you hear me? Good. Um, all right. I think good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending which time zone you are. Uh, let me start with the... Uh, today I'm going to present uh, a tool called Circo. Uh, so let me first do some introductions. Hello. Uh, that's me. So I come from Japan. I know that I don't look very Japanese yet, but I've been living there for 10 years. So you can call me either way. It works both ways, Emilio, Emilio, or something like that. I like to play with networks, packets, and uh, you know, a bit of 3D printing as well. So I did a demo of a few tools already in a couple of conferences. Some of them are in Japan, so you may be aware or not. And just keep in mind, I'm not a programmer. Uh, so the code works, it's nice, and there's a lot of improvement to do. But it runs. As long as it runs, it's well good to go. All right, for those you are not familiar with what is actually the tool itself, the, the idea born actually from the automations. We have a, in, within the enterprise networks, we have a lot of automations tools, and those tools actually are just discovering every new device that connects to the network and actually connect it and provisioning and do a lot of really cool stuff. Sure, but what about if it's not the Cisco switch what you are connecting to? They're basically giving us the credentials for free. Great, that was a good idea, I thought. So what it came out actually was a way to make something camouflage, which is not going to be noticed, and put it in the, when you do red teaming, within a meeting rooms, a, open space, secretary, those kind of places. So I look into find a way to do this. So in this release 1.5, what is new is actually before releases, I was not able to have an IP phone working. So I will go and unplug the IP phone and use that cable, but that's it, the, the IP phone will be off. And that's something that people will notice because either it's not working anymore, and, and I, I wasn't very comfortable. So a few people pointed out as well. So this version, I managed to remove the phone, but plug the phone back to the box itself, and it keep working as it's nothing. So we're going to dig into that. Uh, I, I did uh, some coding uh, updates, and also had some exfiltration techniques, and uh, encryption for prevent forensic, self-destroy switches, integration with Faraday, and bypass NAC, basically. A lot of features, basically, between 1.4 to 1.5. So who do we target? Well, pretty much any automation system out there. These are quite, quite of a few known systems. HPNA is very popular. Uh, of course, uh, NetMRI as well. NAC itself is not an automation system for network provisioning, but what it does is try to prevent things that I'm trying to do, basically. So I will get rid of NAC as well. And of course, there's always an, some admin connecting to things that trust and put password everywhere. Uh, this is an example of things that happen with a Raspberry Pi. You know, some device in the network that nobody noticed you've been like, filtrating data in the NSA. And this is not uncommon because NAC is very hard to solve all our problems. So it did, it did happen. Okay. So what are my main issues for version 1.5? Power options. I'm going to put a Raspberry Pi, which I need power, okay? Battery, PoE. IP phone when I plug it, that looks suspicious. Someone told me about if you find the, the list of enclosure and you open, you can do, you can see the keys where the box is exfiltrating data, except because it's, you know, it's just an SD card and a Linux. Yes, so I need to add some forensic, prevent forensics on it, encryption basically which is a key, always a problem. All right, so let's start with the first problem that is the power. So I came out with the paper idea. That's the easiest one. You just start to drawing things and come up with a list of wishes that you want to do. So this concept was, okay, the POE negotiation is very complicated and it has many standards and there's many different ways to do it. Many implementations are different. 
But there's one thing, one element that the phone and the switch, they will do the negotiation of the power, how much power you need, how many watts, etc., etc. So I didn't want to get into that. So I say, okay, let the phone negotiate. Once that's done, I just hook the power. So it came up with the idea that violate every principle in networking, pretty much. Okay, why not? Let's give it a try. So once you have a paper idea, what you tend to do is breakboarding. Let's do, let's go, come on, plug some cables and see what happens. Something will blow up for sure. So you start to build up some uh, ports and, yeah, this break all network industry standards, by the way. So trust me on that one. So what tends to happen when you start to do this is at some point, without you noticing, this actually works. And I'm like, okay, this is actually a good thing. So now you actually elaborate on it, so you move into prototyping. So this is a little board for just because they keep coming out, the jumpers from the breadboard. So you said, okay, let's make it a bit more stable. So I did a prototype to see, basically it's four RJ45 and a DC to DC converter plus a, a USB socket. So it was a very simple idea. It's all the wiring, the thing that goes underneath. So again, I never designed a PCB, so it would be nice to have a, like a Raspberry hat maybe, or go into that. So I'm still trying to figure out. So for prototyping, it's okay. All right, how Circo evolved between different releases. So Circo has around one year old, maybe, around October 2018. So it started like an idea in a box. When I mean in a box, I mean literally in a cardboard box. <laughs> it was good because you can see the components and you can see, ah, this is this, and you can even put labels on it. So it was quite, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was fun. So what happened here is that I used to use a PoE LAN modules, and I bought one that is, so basically what it does is, it does the PoE negotiation, and then give you a, the LAN back and the power. So I bought one, 12 volts, okay, I need to convert this to five volts, and then I figure out they sell the five volts. So, so this is the first release, right? So then we evolved into a production. So I say, okay, let's move on. So I got some enclosures, they look, they look like these boxes that you have under your desk, over your desk. So the whole concept is, okay, let's work with what we have in the market. So I look, I look for these closures to put stuff in it. So in this release, I only have, you see there's only one cable going on. That's because uh, I, did, I did unplug the phone and that's it. And also did the smaller version. That was a bit more tricky because there's less space, but you can use a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is, it's a bit cool, but you really need to work with the space. Again, this version has only one LAN. So you need to work with the LAN adapters on the Raspberry Pi. Right, so we move to this version. This, this version is actually this box. This box, because I remember, now I'm still in the phone, and I'm going to plug back the phone here. So what I'm going to do is use two different LAN adapters on the Raspberry Pi. So that's the reason I have a USB LAN adapter plus the onboard. Or uh, as well as on the bottom, you will see a DC-DC converter, the 48 volts of PoE back to five volts to power the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and on the, ye the yellow thing that you may see there, that's actually a magnet switch. You say, well, I print, uh, 3D print some uh, uh, handles to mount it, but it's basically a magnet and a tilt uh, magnet switch. So what it does, that is the killer. When you open the case, it will detect that you open it and you know, you can RM, RF, you can do whatever you want. Reboot, shut down. So this is to prevent forensic in case some forensic go, don't unplug the cables and just open the suspicious case that they found. It will blow up basically if you want to. That was a bit dangerous to do. EPMs, you know, heat ups, fire hazards, so just be careful. Of course, the same thing into the smaller, the smaller box as well. He said, here, what I need to do is tune USB LAN adapters and a hub. So it gets tricky, but still fit. So depending what you find in the market as a discussed box, you can play around. So how much this costs? Because this must be a really expensive thing. Well, this is an example of how this box costs, right? So to give you an idea, this is a Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, the two USB LAN adapters, the 
USB, micro USB hub are like ridiculously small. And uh, just the, the outlet, which is one of the things more expensive. The outlet, I think, is well, $10, $10 or something. So yeah, you can get this for 50 bucks. It's, so if you don't want to go to pick it up, so you do a pen testing, you leave it there, you are welcome to go and pick it up or not. Depend how, how well things finish on the pen testing report, right? So, you know, just in case you want to lose it. All right, so the hardware is one thing. It's very simple components. It's a LAN adapters, Raspberry Pi, plastic box, and some DC, DC bucket. So now the question is what we are using as a software. Well, Circo is actually the little box, but we also have a few components. We have a component called Carpa, which is actually a software component only running on the internet in a VPS, Python, and a Linux. That's very simple components. So that's software only. Why? Because once this box is getting infiltrated into the network, what is it going to do? Well, it's going to become a Cisco switch to get discovered. So all these are lovely automation systems will connect to me and give me the credentials. So essentially, it's a honeypot, basically. But what happens once I have the credentials? SNMP, Telnet, SSH, whatever the user sent to me. Great, now I need to exfiltrate to the internet. And this is the tricky part, because I need something on the internet to receive it. And that was Carpa coming to play. It's, it's, I, at the moment, I have a demo here, which I run it on a Raspberry Pi Linux. You can, you can run it anywhere in any VPS in the internet, Amazon or any VPS server will do. The only requirement is that you have a domain name assigned to NSR, NS records assigned to this public IP of your VPS, or NAT if you have a NAT. -ed. So, and then we have one more, one more component, which is Howla. Howla is, a, again, software component. You can run it on the Raspberry Pi with a power bank and a wireless adapter. What it does is basically, you can also exfiltrate via wireless. So you also, it will do from the box itself to the internet or via wireless, or both if you want to. But the via wireless, of course, you need to be a proximity. Keep in mind here, we are not setting up any access point. This is not an access point because that will be catched by a WIPS, right? Whips. So we don't want any whips to notice us. So currently it's in Python 2, coming into 3 soon. And it's all packet manipula manipulation are mainly based in SCAPI in Python. And we are using some other tools from a different uh, uh, com combination of people as well. For example, for the OS Fuller, some part of the code of the OS Fuller to, to full NAC, effectively speaking. And what the actual filtration we can use, we have ping, uh, traceroute, NTP, HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, proxy, and wireless, of which uh, all of these are atomic. Basically, nothing come back ever. So from a firewall point of view, it's a timeout session, H out. So there's never a session in none of those protocols that I just mentioned, or established connection, or anything back. So basically, the CARPA never sent anything back to me. And another new feature that came out is just because I have a phone, right, and the phones keep working, I'm basically manning the middle between the phone and the network. However, most of the offices, people connect the phone and the PC to the phone. So that automatically gives me free traffic from the PC as well. So that was a free bug, kind of. So if effectively speaking, you can run different tools to ex capture uh, Telnet, SSH, uh, FTPs, or uh, unencrypted protocols or hashes uh, and exfiltrate it as well. So not just the network part, but also the PC, if any, connected to it. So how I become a Cisco switch? Well, I need to be able to send a CDP, LLDPs, uh, I need to be able to have an SNMP server agent basically running, and Telnet, an SSH, and all my packets need to look like a Cisco switch. So that was the triage basically of how we come out. So for flows, I have a single mode that used to be when you on, don't connect the phone back, and the bridge mode, which is the most interesting for this talk. <coughs> so in bridge mode, this is how, how it will work the logic, right? So once you turn this box turn on, what it does is does the discovery first to see what is the switch I'm is close to me, the real switch, and try to get the name. Once you get the name, he will try to get one similar to itself. So if this switch, for example, is switch Tokyo 01, he will become 03, or 
you will change the last digit for by two. You know, the logic is very simple. If no, you, they are always a fallback to test your one. You know, we need to pretend to be a nice new brand Cisco switch in the network. So we want to get that information first, then we get an IP address and we start to uh, set it up. The, of course, the MAC address, it is of the Cisco switch. We changed MAC address at the beginning. As well, well, one thing we want to do is to start to advertise CDP and LLDP to the switch. That's the way we get discovered with this automation tool. They, they, what tend to happen is the, the existing production switch is already hooked to automation tool, and when he sees CDP and LLDP neighbor, new neighborhoods, he will discover that on the system, and the system once a day will connect and try to pull the config, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, give us the credentials. So once uh, this happen. Once we get the credentials, we can set it up to how often we want to exfiltrate it. So, I, I, and I will cycle if we want to just do it once or do it every one hour, the same ex exfiltration and which method you want, all of them. So to do this demo, I actually need to build a network with a proper switch and a firewall and a router and a DHCP and the internet. And so I used to have all this spread in the desk it was very difficult to set it up. You always forget one cable and things don't work. So, because in, J in Japan we have a Toyota that make uh, cars, right? So, it came out with Maccheroni. This is our uh, infrastructure in a box, basically, so in a briefcase. And it, it only costs 200 bucks. It doesn't cost 28 grand like Toyota. But what it does is simpl simplify things very much. And so, the lab itself, I know, everything has an acronym, right? It match perfectly. So the lab itself looks like this. It's basically a proper Cisco, you can look it up after if you want to. It's a proper Cisco switch, and the CarPi is emulated with a Raspberry Pi. I also hook a Snort in the outside on the internet to see what the Snort will see. This Snort is configured as it come in the middle, like there's no actually uh, any tuning. So it's default, basically, all. So it's supposed to catch even rubbish traffic as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do is explain how the exfiltration technique works. So for exfiltration, what I'm doing, I need to be able to tell my device in the internet which these credentials, who took it from. So it came from uh, my telnet daemon, my SSH daemon, through NCNMP, or even the PC that was hooked. That's an optional work I'm working. Also, I want to know that this is an enabled password of the switch, or is the user and password of the switch? And it's SNMP, the community, of, basically. This work with SNMP 1, 2, V2 as well. 3, not yet. But nobody used to actually in any network that I'm aware. But uh, so this is the format and the source IP of the either automation tool or the laptop administrator, that whoever connect to my box. Right, that is, this is a specifically the format that the, we want to exfiltrate. So the way, one way to exfiltrate this data is, first of all, we will encrypt it with AES-256. So let me first go into Showtime. Let's start with the demo. Let me see if you can see that. Let me close this. Uh, so, so yeah. I cannot see though. I cannot see what I'm typing. Let me bring back. Can I mirror? I don't know how to do this. Look better now? Look okay? Yep, yeah? all right. So, so this is my server in the internet. So when I run it, I just say, uh, well, this give me uh, the options of the server. So this is my snort. This is my administrator PC. 
And what I need now is my box. I also have this is a, because this version integrates with Faraday. So let me log in. So Faraday, just I have one workspace and I have hosts. I only have one host with some vulnerabilities. All right, so let me do the magic. Do need to put a magnet because I open this the lid. So I need to, you know, hack the lid open type of thing. But on the phone, it's currently working. So what you do is you take the phone out. This is my LAN from the switch. So you plug it on LAN. And now I plug in an extra cable from the phone. The actual phone. The player, right? And there's a lot of flashing light here. But that is just in a Raspberry Pi. Nothing more interesting than that. So one thing that did, I did find out was how to prevent a encryption. So I'm going to use Lux to encrypt the partition where I'm going to have the software here in case someone found it. The problem with encryption is to decrypt you need a, you, to encrypt and decrypt you need a key. So what happens with it when you want to do that in a box that you, is already closed? You go there and put it. You don't have a laptop and installation system to spend or put a key, keyboard to Raspberry or whatever. So what I came up with is I need a long key that I can use quickly to un encrypt, mount and encrypt this Raspberry Pi. So I found that this Raspberry Pi has Bluetooth. Great. So I create the there's a million of applications. There's a Bluetooth application that you can create the services. You can do it by, from a Linux as well. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a service called Circo, and it has the UID, UUID, which is 128 bits. So guess what? That's my key. So what this guy is doing, once he boot up, at the moment it's in demo mode, so in the mean like I, can sh I should be able to access. So, if I do the F, the, the home drive that I want to do is the, is called P and keep. So if I do, there's nothing because it's not, it's not mounted, right? So what I'm going to do is turn on these Bluetooth services. It's a demo key, it's in case you are sniffing Bluetooth. It's not for production use, right? So once I turn on, it run every five seconds, I think I put it, or 10 seconds. What it does basically is it's scanning to see if it found the services and use that key to mount and encrypt, decrypt looks. So ideally this is all automatically actually. So let me see, I think it's 10 seconds every, run every 30 seconds, 10 seconds, I can't remember what I put it. So it's, I create the services. Uh, you see? System looks yeah. I created a little script basically to do that. Let me see. This is on. Oh, maybe I have Bluetooth off. That would explain. There you go. No way. It's jamming Bluetooth, right? This is what happened with live demos. Come on. It's not coming. It did work before. Yeah. Yes. Let me stop start. And let me do start. Maybe it's my phone. Uh, 
I think it's my phone actually. manually let me create this Oops. oh it did work <laughs> oh it was already mounted yeah well playing with bluetooth within defcon sometimes no good idea so let me turn off this bump back off, <laughs> right? It's already mounted. So let me go to, this normally will still start automatically, but so, oops. So I just to give you the menu. So I have Carpa, which is the one in the internet to receive the credentials, which I'm going to start in the voice mode. And the plugin is a Faraday plugin. And the interface is zero and just a file where you want to put the output, the credentials you find. And so this is the Circo interface. So what you do, first of all, we go into bridge mode. Well, I put their voice. We go into bridge mode because it's the one using the phone and the LAN at the same time. You still have backward compatibility because that's a way, good way to do things. Uh, and then we can choose what the exfiltration technique we want it. You can choose either all or let's, can you ping, DNS, uh, HTTP, uh, web, uh, NTP, uh, proxy, I don't know. And, Tracer, I could put to oh, minus A actually. So when you start it, let me see, this one already start and logging into Faraday, okay. The lo plug into Faraday, what it does basically is every credential that get, he get, he will inject it into Faraday directly. So when the circo starts is in verbose mode, that's the reason you see all the steps that what it's doing. So it start becoming a Cisco MAC address switch. This is to bypass NAC. Due to the MAC address I'm using, it's a golden one. So if you read through NAC, fork out NAC manual, there's a very small syntax that says, if you use this MAC address, you always allow it. Just read the document, should be fine, right? Guess what? That's what I'm using. <laughs> Great, thank you for the manual. So, become a, you, you, can you read, right? Yes? Do you know I can make it bigger? That's too big? Better? Yeah? So, what it does is we, well, we become a switch, discover, we become a MAC address switch, discover, start the ACP, configure the interface. So this is all the configuration proxy. The, pro the proxy, I have three different techniques for the proxy, we'll go into details. This one is using the ACP. And then from here onwards, it becomes a, a honeypot, right? The last line you see is because the magnet I put there. The lid is open, but I put a magnet manually. So if I take that magnet out, things will go crazy. So now, I'm going to go to the real switch. This is my real switch, right? This is Tokyo 01, it's, it's my real switch. If I don't show CDP, neighbors, guess what? I see a phone, and I also see a switch called 03, it's a 2960. You can show the details, and this is, yeah, it has an IP address, this is a version, the port, the soft, it's a Cisco switch. So I can see show CDP and show LLDP as well, I can see LLDP. So this switch, believe, is connect, someone connected a new switch, maybe in a meeting room for a training or something. So it does have an IP address, which is 151, all right? So this is my admin PC. What happens if I turn it, that IP address? 
I get the same prompt. Okay, so I tap my super user and switch number three. So now in a, what I believe is a switch. I can run commands, Cisco commands, show version, yep, it's a 2960, this is the version running, show, show IP route, show IP app, show MAC address, show interface description. It is a Cisco switch, where I believe it. Uh, show CDP, neighbors. I need to type it correctly, of course, it's a Cisco switch. Yeah, I can see now Cisco uh, switch one, the production one. So they see each other, in theory, same with the show LLDP neighbors. Yeah, they, I can see, so from this switch, so when automation systems connect to this switch, either by Telnet or SSH, with the master credentials, they will run a set of commands to get the configuration, inventory, et cetera, et cetera. So those are most of the commands that support. I did not call the whole iOS simulator just for fun. It wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah, the question mark also worked, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and if you want to go to show run, of course, you need to be enable mode. Okay, go enable. <laughs> yes, sure. Great, secret. Now I can do show run. Yeah, that work. What I can do is conf t. No, that doesn't work. That's the common stack access errors because I'm not going to prepare an iOS, basically, right? So this was a tenant that I did, right? So you can see in the configuration that the community is public. The SNMP community. Now, what tends to happen is automation system will first try the own SNMP community, and if fail, it will try the public, you know, one of the least of the common ones. So let's say that I will try the system community, the one that they use in the company, right? So when I try that, that will not work. But A, because it's public, the one that works. But you did, give, you did already give in the community with that command. So when you do public, it does reply like a Cisco switch. It is actually a name, the uptime, the version. It is a full SNMP device that you can pull. Now, what happened when I went back to Carpa? Well, I start to receive this data. This is because it's verbose. So basically it's telling me that something via ping from this public IP, Telnet, user net admin, password, they've gone, very smart, from this source IP they connect, which is the internal IP of this administrator laptop automation system. And then I get the same password via ping, DNS, trace route. PDNS is proxy, by the way, HTTP, NTP, and then I also get this via here. So, oops, someone connect, telnet, enable, like the E just stand by enable with this super secret password. So again, if, if I now do the same thing, uh, let me open the, so this is what this uh, LIPS is looking. Ignore the unreachable because I don't have internet connection, of course. But the only traffic that these guys can see, because I enable uh, the default, is a ping. So a Cisco switch is sending a packet ping. Nothing come back, but that's the only alarm, which I don't know anyone that has a snort with IC ping configured for alarms. Uh, that would be quite a lot of alarms. That's the only thing you can see on the snort side. So again, when you see a P and the community, it didn't, the switch, my switch did not reply to the community, but you did give it to me. It did reply to public, but not to the community you, you give me, but I exfiltrated. So now if I go to a, uh, Faraday, right? So when I do a host, when I do refresh, now I have an, a new extra host. This 10.10.10.88 is the source IP of the automation tool or administrator, then the, whoever is connecting. So what happens if, if I go to the credentials, I can see the target, I can see the pro, well, protocol, this comes to Telnet, the enable and the password. This is the Telnet, the username and the password. And this is a SNMP. I should put SNMP instead of P. But uh, so now, as soon as I get them in Carpa via an API, I can inject it in Faraday in real time. So that's for helping the pen testing report side. So now, what happens if I actually remove the magnet? You know? Careful. 
So you start to see this alarm, alarm open, alarm open. That means that the, because I did not unplug it, right? I removed the magnet. So what it does is we, when you detect that someone opened the case, the magnet get open, it will send a magic packet via exfiltration saying that someone opened it. So, you know, maybe they are it's time to make their report. So, so of course you can make it if you go here, for example, this was the circle running in debug mode, right? So you see that it's sending the credentials, <laughs> and here is when I took the magnet off, right? You can do this, for example. That command, what it does is in immediately reboot. So what it does, remember, because we have the Bluetooth encryption, so unless you are, I'm back close to this box with this thing enabled, that will not work if you reboot. So if someone unplug it and replug it, it will not mount encryption. So that is a balance between having encryption and functionality. So if you want encryption, you want the Bluetooth, sure. But if someone by mistake unplug and replug it, it will not work again. You need to be back, walking around with the mobile in your pocket, right? <laughs> so yeah, you can do whatever you want. You can, you know, eat PGM pools, I don't know, burn, fires, whatever you like it there. So this is the way that this stuff work. So these are the components. So let me go into deep into the exfiltration. Uh, something's in the middle, right? Excuse me. There you go. Go away. All right. So how I do? Ex so this is basically a nice honeypot. Now, how do I take the data out? That is the interesting point. So this is going back to basics. So we are using protocols that are through firewalls. Some of them are blocking the companies, some of them are con can go through. So for example, some companies do allow ping to go for troubleshooting or trace route. So we, these are the protocols I'm using. ICNMP, I'm using specific TCP and IP and UDP packets fields to actually put my data. Remember I have one line, we say T, dash, uh, the comma, username, comma, password, comma, and IP address. That, what I do is encrypt it, AAS-256, and now chunk it in two bytes or six bytes. So the way to work encryption, basically to decrypt it, you need to tell me how many packets I should expect, how long should my crypto be. So I'm going to send you six, uh, 13 bytes of crypto in seven packets, two bytes each. So first of all, I need to be able to tell that in advance before sending the packets. So what I'm doing is I'm sending one packet. Let me, these are the IP, IP header. There's a field called identification in IP packets. That do not get changed by NAT. When you NAT through a firewall, that doesn't get changed. So OK, it's two bytes that I can use for something. ICMP packets. Within the ICMP packet, you also have identification and sequence numbers. Again, two and two bytes that I can use for something. So ICMP, how it works? Basically, I need to tell you my 13 bytes and seven packets. So I will send one, one packet saying that 213 is the IP ID, right? And the rest is just randoms. So that means that the receiver knows that he's expecting 13 bytes, right? Then I'm going to send you 307 as an IP ID. 300 means that they actually you're expecting seven packets, right? And then I will send you seven packets, right? With the 500, one, 500, two, as a sequence ID. That is a sequence of a packet, in case they get, they get the different order arrived, right? And the crypto, within the ICMP sequence, which is two bytes, I will get that become an integer, and that will be my crypto. So I need seven packets to do 13 bytes, plus padding, right? One, one byte of padding. So this is the way that most of the filtration technique works. It's basically chunking data into specific fields within uh, different protocols, like ping, for example, or traceroute. Traceroute, we are using uh, the data payload. For Cisco switch, the last four bytes are rubbish. So we are using those four bytes with X. My encrypted data become X. So I encode it into X, so it looks like an hexadecimal string. So that's a good place to put four bytes. Again, similar concept. First, I need to tell you I'm sending 30 bytes and seven packets, and then I send you one by one. Now, if we move into HTTP or HTTPS, remember, 
I'm not making a session. I'm just merely sin sending the scene packet. That's it. So there's something called window size in TCP and do not change between the client and the server through NAT. So you have NAT and that thing doesn't change. Again, great. So I have a one, two bytes that I can use that does not change between an internal client and an internet server. So that's what I'm using. Similar concept, I'm using the uh, send it 213 and this, like we saw in, in ICMP, but I'm putting the crypto within the window size of the TCP packet. So yeah, port 80, 443, or any port you like, 25 if you want to. But remember, most of the stuff probably don't have direct access to the internet. So those, those exfiltration may not work. HTTP, HTTPS, actually any TCP port will be the same concept on this, right? You just put, send the thing, nothing come back, and in the crypto goes into the window size. Of course, I become an integer, right? It's just supposed to be a number. So from X, I convert it into an integer. And the whole process is in reverse in the other side. In the carpa, it's the other side receiving, it's the whole thing the other way around. So NTP, NTP was a bit fun. There's something called transmission uh, timestamp, right? So the transmission timestamp has this format. So it's basically a timestamp plus a fraction. And the timestamp is 32 bits, and the fra fraction is 32 bits. Wait a minute, that's, that's a lot of data I can put there in the 32 bits, I say. So I'm using the fraction. So basically the way that works is I'm using, I'm playing with the stratum and pole to tell them the, again, my crypto is 13 bytes, and it will send seven packets or six packets or whatever is the padding that I need to do. In this case, I can send four bytes. So in reality, I don't need seven packets because it's 13 bytes, so maybe four packets will do. So I need to tell them that it's four packets for this protocol specifically. And then I put it in the fraction, convert it into a, or an integer, or actually it's a float, because it's 32 bits. But, and then the process the other way. So inside NTP query, I'm putting the fraction timestamp of the transmission timestamp, uh, 32 bits of it. DNS packet, this one is easy. It just uses subdomain. Encrypted dot mydomain.com. But I'm not sending a query to the internet. I'm sending an NS query to the actually internal DNS on the company. So this, this attack is not direct. So I don't have access to go outside. But the DNS server has internet resolution through, pro, through a relay or, or direct maybe. So what it tends to happen when you do an NS query, what it does, you will do recursive until you get it. Assuming your DNS actually has internet resolution. Again, this is a hash encrypted, it's 20 bytes, uh, 13 bytes we talk, so it's not a very long char. Uh, you send it one, one query. Here is, you don't need multiple. So in this case, is the, well, the flow of the thing. You will send just to the DNS server, internal DNS server, and the DNS server will go just directly to the, the trick here is that NS server should be Carpa, the IP address, the public IP, of course, of that evil domain that you're using. Now, what happens when the company do not have DNS resolution as well. You know, no access to internet in any protocol, no DNS resolution, external DNS resolution. All right, proxy. They might have something. So proxy works in a way, how you discover proxy? Well, through how you set up in PC's proxy. DACP option 252, WAP, or GPO. Those are the three, three main, or manually, but don't think people do that anymore. Uh, th those are the three more, most common. Okay, so what I do for DHCP, I will do a DHCP inform to the actually the uh, DHCP server to see if that option 252 is there and get the pack file. So what you get is actually a pack file server, right? URL. Get there, connect, get the pack file, parse it to get the proxy IP and port, then connect to the proxy, right? And of course, all proxies are most likely authenticated. Doesn't matter. This doesn't need authenticate to the proxy to work. So this is a bit tricky because this unfortunately works with all blue codes, McAfee's, all the like high-end proxies because they forgot about something. When I do a telnet, a simple telnet to a proxy, and I do a get HTTP my, domain, my crypto put dot my domain, and of course I do enter, enter, and I get a 403, right, from the proxy. However, the proxy will generate the log in the system saying this IP address, try to go to this URL, and he got a 403. But you, a proxy does one more thing. 
he does an S query of that URL to put it log, the IP, which there's no IP. But what that means is he, which has DNS resolution, now is querying my DNS server with a string that I want to send. So he's, <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> that, that will do. Uh, so yes, it does generate one entry of 403 in a proxy logs. You know how many of those you get in a proxy constantly? Millions. So yeah, great. That works if we have the ACP of 252. OK, sometimes you have WAP, if you still have WAP. Similar concept, I just will look for the WAP DNS entry, connect to the pack file, get the proxy, and do all, all over again. But again, no DACP, no WAP, so pro most likely GPO. So the last thing I can do is DNS guessing. Basically, you give an array of names, like uh, keywords, internet, or gateway, or GW, or PRX, or proxy, or gateway something. So you do that list of 10, 15 words, and I will generate a dictionary with a dash, with an underscore, backward and forwards. A matrix, and I will generate a list of 12, we'll say maybe 280, and then I will try with the DNS internal which one actually replied back to me. Then I will test, is this a, pack, is this a proxy, a pack file server? So I will try to connect and try to get a pack file. Could be something else. If it doesn't work, I will keep trying until I see something. So this is the way to go around the GPO. Because GPOs, you need to have access to a Windows to actually see them. They're not being, it's per profile, basically. So you can't really sniff it out the network. And the last thing is the wireless. For wireless exfiltration, remember I say I'm not setting up a wireless access point. I'm using beacons, very short beacons of uh, 500 milliseconds. So what I'm doing is, within the beacons, I'm using uh, the SSID names of the wireless at home and in many places, normally tend to have like an X address, the last six digits of the MAC address of that home router is on the name of the wireless SSID. So I'm taking the opportunity to mirror that I'm broadcasting, but instead of those MAC address, my, par, part of my, my crypto. So again, I have a 13 byte, I will chop it in three, I will have six, six, and one, we'll get padding, and then broadcast for 500 milliseconds that SSID of each of the three. And the receiver will be looking for who is, it's like a phone broadcasting SSIDs for a very short time of period. So that's the reason WIPs will not see it. Basically, I'm using beacons as a back channel to push data out for credentials. And that's it. And what I have. <laughs> Questions? Or oh, no? <laughs> Can you defeat MaxSec? But the thing is, when you connect the switch, right, what you have is actually a phone connected to the switch. So most NAC systems, so if you like, you want to have a network with one MAC address allowed only. Well, most of the company has a phone. The phone need, tend to have a PC after. So you need at least two, minimum, right? So because you are putting a, a Cisco switch and the MAC address, that, well, well, Raspberry Pi, the MAC address I'm using is actually a golden MAC. NAC cannot block that one. Because the trick is very simple. There's a MAC address for virtual, uh, like HSRP or VRRP services. Cisco HSRP is a routing uh, stamp gateway, right? So what it does is they have virtual MAC address that they create. Those virtual MAC address are whitelisted by default in all NACs, based on the documentation. I did not write it. So I use one of those. Any other question? Yeah, where? This one? Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I will release the version after DEF CON, no time over DEF CON, it's procrastination, but uh, I will push it out to GitHub the new, newest version, and the, the guide for the building, well, building is, to be honest, quite straightforward to it doesn't require it to be electronics to do that. It's just a Raspberry Pi and a few things. But, uh, and the presentation, I believe the slides will be up soon. We put it in the website as well. There's a website somewhere? Yeah. That there's stickers on the back, if someone wants stickers. 
If not, let me know. I still have some stickers. If no more questions, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>